It's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Christy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 64 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day and we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Hazelnut. And it's delicious. I love hazelnut coffee. Simple, but delicious. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's nighttime. Yeah. How did this happen? Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. We have been doing a lot of nighttime recording. We're burning the midnight oil. Honestly, this is such a passion of ours that the hours of work we put in, we don't even count. Oh, I count them. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm not saying I don't love it, but I do count them. They take us into the wee hours of whatever. I mean, like, we're Mm -hmm. always in this studio. Okay, the studio is in the middle of being made over. Right. And in the spring, we're going to paint this whole area, put all of our stuff up, and then we can show everybody where we spend uh, hours and hours. That's going to look amazing. I look forward to that. So what did you do for Valentine's Day? Made dinner, hung out, snuggled with the dogs, watched movies. I made the red velvet cupcakes. Yes, which is a good recipe from last week. Yeah, it turned out really well. With Valentine's Day being on a Monday this year, mm-hmm. it was kind of a busy weekend because Super Bowl... Pete and I just stayed home, watched the Super Bowl at home. That's what we usually do. And Valentine's Day was the next day. I got up to find a giant bouquet of roses on the table, which was super nice. That's always super nice. Yeah. We had our family over. And Alyssa, Joey, and the girls came over. Mm-hmm. We you had, had a house full. We had a house full because we have not had holidays with anybody. You and I had our holidays the this, other weekend, exactly, which was so nice. Yeah, it was nice. That was we really all nice. got to get together. Mm-hmm. Pete came over. We all had lunch together. Mm-hmm. So this was my weekend to get together with my family. Uh huh. Very, very But busy. nice, but nice. It's I love nice. it because I haven't seen anybody in forever. No. Other thing is, I can't wait till spring because it's cold down here. Yeah. We need I'm to really... figure out how to use that thing. What, the wood stove? Can we use it? Is it I don't know. I don't know. We got a wood stove in the chicken studio. We got to figure out if we can use it. Seriously, because you're about to hear like when we record. Oh, I, it's it's very cold down here. I can't stand to be outside when it's this bitter. I, it's it's so oh, cold. I just can't. Anyway. I feel so bad for the chickens. I'm like, oh my goodness. Come on, spring, please. Mm-hmm. That's all I got to say. Let me just take a minute to ask everybody a huge favor. If you are listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. We absolutely love them. And we've had a few recently. And you have made our day. Yeah, really nice reviews. Thank you. We love them. It's big smiles on our faces. And we love reading them. Thank you. Thank you. It helps the podcast grow. It really does. If you're looking for other ways to support the podcast, you can visit our Etsy shop. Check out the t-shirts we have on sale. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, you can go to patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. You can check out our levels of membership and the benefits that come with them. One of the benefits for the top two tiers is a monthly bonus episode. And the other thing is for the top tier, you get a monthly Zoom call. And if you have any chicken questions, that is the time to bring them. You can support the show by subscribing so you never miss an episode. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. The other thing you can do to help support the show is buy products from our sponsors and use our affiliate links to get your discounts. Yay! We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. From now until the end of February, you can receive 20% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy and nutritious grubs, plus all products chip free If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot come by with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code COFFEE20. Try it today. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then, yeah. Let me just take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products and the chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the January box, I absolutely love the rooster bottle opener and the seed sprouting kit. 
I love the Poppy Adventures book and coloring book, and the knitted headband is going to keep my ears so warm. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. It's such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Okay, so now it's about that time for... Da, 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 Spotlight, yeah. The Brie Spotlight this week is... The Olive Acre. The Olive Acre. Yeah, so we're doing another hybrid. A little bit different than the production hybrids we've been doing lately, though. They are, and... This is one of my favorite of the hybrids. I've always liked the Olive Acre, but you know what happens. I do this research and then I'm like, <laughs> hmm. You're like, I can see an Olive Acre in my flock. So as we said, the Olive Acre is a hybrid. They started showing up in North America in the past 10 years or so. It's not been long. Yeah. They're also found in the UK, Europe, Australia, and most of the chicken keeping world. So the Olive Acre is actually called an Olive Acre because of the beautiful color of that egg. Yeah. Gertie was supposed to be an olive acre. Gertie was really the wrong chick in the bin. Gertie's a well summer. So everyone out there, I purchased an olive acre. Yes. You were very excited too. This is the egg color. I wanted the olive green, that sage green egg. It's mm -hmm. an army green. Some have speckles. Some yeah. don't. I mean, they're really across the green spectrum. There's the olive. There's the sage. There's the army green. There's sort of sea green. There's yellow green. They're really beautiful. And Sophia picked the one chicken that looked I know. Different. Yeah, the color, it's the result of a blue egg being overlaid with a brown pigment in the hen's overdone. Right. For more on that amazing process, go back and listen to episode 28. We did talk a lot about it. And you're right. So that's what happens when you put brown over blue. We talked about that. You get those shades of green. Yeah. And they are gorgeous. The mm -hmm. sage is my favorite when it comes out looking like Oh, it's like beautiful. Sage. Yeah. Not that I have a sage egg. No. Because Gertie is Gertie. I have seen chickens called sage eggers as well. I think in the UK. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that an olive eager? But I'm not sure. I didn't even look into that. That just popped into my mind right now while we were talking. So I haven't researched it, but I have seen a sage eager. Okay. So the hens lay about 150 to 180 or more large eggs. Mm -hmm. Not in my high category. I would put that's about three per week. About average. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a that's a decent about layer. Average. That's a decent layer. The hens, apparently, a lot of the hens will go broody. I guess that depends on what their really? parents stock. But yeah, I've read that in a lot of places. That blows my mind. I didn't think they were because mm -hmm. the well summers don't go broody. I, I know, I know. I, I'm sure it depends on your mix. But yeah, I saw that in more than one place that the hens go broody. Because the olivegar is a hybrid, they don't breed true. And of course, there's no breed standard. There can't be. They look different. Right. Appearances vary widely. One of the things that is, it's not uniform, but a lot of them are either brown, black, or blue. They tend to be those colors. Most of them have a straight comb. Right. They may or may not have feathered legs. They may or may not be crested. And they may or may not have beards and or muffs. It depends on which cross of chickens you're using, mm -hmm. which characteristics are going to come out exactly. in this olive acre. I mean, this is a chicken that's bred basically all for the color of the egg. That's exactly what it is. Egg color is absolutely the main thing they're selected for. They tend to be a larger hen. Right. Around six or seven pounds for the hens, seven to nine pounds for your roosters. So good sized birds. They are. And they're pretty calm. They're friendly birds, and they're good for backyard flocks. Mm -hmm. They're going to live a little longer than a different hybrid that's that, bred for extreme numbers of eggs, larger eggs. Right. This hybrid is bred purely for the color of the egg, so they're kind of like a heritage breed in a way. They are. I mean, I was thinking about that as I was doing this. So as you said, they are not production birds. No. So they do tend to have a, a longer lifespan than the production reds and the sex-linked hybrids. And one of the things I like about them is that they're coming from heritage breeds. Right. Their parent stock is heritage breeds. Exactly. So that makes them a little different. They're a different type of a hybrid. Right. They are supposed to be reasonably cold hardy. But because they're a big chicken, they may need extra cooling in the summer or in warm climates. Again, depending on which parents they pick, mm -hmm. which breeds. Yeah. I've never seen one in person, but I've read in various places that the roosters are actually very kind and friendly and nice to have around. This one does remind me of a good family bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with cool green eggs. Yeah. So the genetics. Let's do it. To make an olive acre, 
one of the parents has to have the blue egg laying gene. Correct. That means it must be an Arcana or one of the blue egg laying breeds that was developed from the Arcana. Leg bars. Or Americanas. Yeah. The other parent has to be a dark egg layer. Right. So there you're looking at a Moran or a Well Summer or Barnet Builder. There are some other of the continental breeds yeah. that do this as well. So I know I'm like getting a little off subject, but with Gertie, this is what I started to do because I thought I bought an olive egg. Right. So then I start looking at her as a chick saying, okay. Where does she fit in with these breeds? Uh-huh. Do you remember that I whole do. thing? I do. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Trying to figure out, what is she? Yeah. She was laying a brown egg, and I'm like... It's not a super dark brown egg. It's a dark no. brown egg. It's not super dark brown. It's just kind of a regular old brown egg. Yeah, so we're trying to figure out who Gertie was in this olive acre world. We come to find out she looks the most like an actual well summer. Oh, that was a funny thing. You were texting me pictures of these breeds. Do you think she's this? Do you think she's this? Do you think she's this? And then you put her photo on Instagram and several people were like, that is a well summer. Exactly. And she really looks and acts like a well summer. We so. even looked up brown leghorns because she looks yes. a lot like a brown leghorn, yeah. but those earlobes weren't white and she's not laying a white egg. Right, so right. That kind of got thrown out. But the olive eggers can have such a wide variety of looks because if you look at these chickens, the Aracana, Americana, the leg bars, the Morans, they all have quite distinctive looks. They do. Mm-hmm. So you mix them up in any kind of way. I mean, you're going to get Something different chicken every time. <laughs> I mean, some of the Morans have the feathered legs. That's where that comes from. Yeah. You had the leg bars with the bigger crest. You know, we like an origin story for chickens. And exactly. I, I spent a lot of time trying to find origins, like who were the first people who started playing with this mixture? And I found nothing, essentially. So it probably was just somebody who wanted a green egg. Sometimes a lot of people come up with the same idea at the same time. Yeah. So colored eggs were starting to become popular. So it's very possible that there were pockets of people here and there that started experimenting for egg color. If I can get a blue egg, then I should be able to get a green egg. Right. And how can I do that? I guess unless you experimented, would you know? If you understood the mechanics of how eggs end up colored, you know that the blue completely permeates the egg where the brown pigment is laid over top in the oviduct. If you understood that, you could probably plan for it. Otherwise, I think it would just be a happy accident. Or it could have been a monk. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't find any records of any monks breeding for color, but yeah. It could have been. Except the silverwood's blue, because clearly, I mean... He bred for a green egg, right? Yeah, exactly. Martin Silverrod. So this could have just been a hybrid of the people. Hey, I want a green egg. How am I going to do mm-hmm. it? And exactly what you said. If this is the way you get a blue egg, blue and brown is going to make a green. Right. And experimenting. And then by word of mouth, hey, where'd you get that green egg? Exactly. Well, I've, I've read these two Social media together. probably had a lot to do with the driving force behind this as well. Yeah. These so, colored eggs are so huge. Yeah, Exactly. As we said, there's no set mix for the parent stock. Breeders have their own practices. Yes. My pet chicken actually does two different mixes. Okay. So they do a leg bar cross with a Moran, and then they do an Americana cross with a Moran. Okay. And they offer two. They offer their classic olive agar. Right. And then they offer this adorable bird called the partridge olive agar. Wow. Which really looks to have cream leg bar parentage. They have a very distinct look. If you take a look at it, my pet chicken cream leg bar. Yeah. They're adorable. Very obvious leg bar parentage. And also they must be super popular because they were sold out on a lot of dates. Oh, wow. On others. Yeah. You know, the Morans, they're using that chicken. To me, I like the personality of the Well Summer bred into this chicken uh-huh. because I feel like the Well Summer, I mean, I have Gertie, he's a Well Summer, so I'm going to say that, but they have such a friendly personality. Right. And so do the leg bars. Right. You know, so it's like, I don't know. I mean, the friendly chicken must be the one whose DNA wins out because they have a really good reputation for being gentle, friendly exactly. chickens. Yeah. So sometimes you hear about F1 and F2 olivegers. Have heard you ever that. seen that? Yes. Yeah. So what does this mean? An F1 hybrid, F1 stands for filial one hybrid. Okay. Obviously filial as in offspring. Right. An F1 hybrid is the first generation of offspring from distinctly different types of parents. Okay. In this case, it would be two different breeds of chickens. Okay. The F2 is a cross between two F1 crosses. Oh, okay. So it's the next generation. So you're breeding an olive acre to an olive acre. Right. Exactly. Basically. You're breeding two F1 olive acres together. This works in olive eggers because they're bred for color eggs and not production. Exactly. Because like the Golden Comet that we spotlight back in episode 60. Right. Production hybrids 
So that's your Golden Comet, your Isa Brown, exactly. your Amber Star, all yeah. of those. They are always F1s. Right. You can't breed that chicken to that chicken to get it. Right. So you can always breed an olive acre to an olive acre and still get an, an olive acre with a green. Yes. And you're always that you're into that F2 cross. Exactly. exactly. So why would you breed a combination of F1s and F2s? I was curious about this. I have no clue. Because the way genetics works, the F1s have a 1 16th chance of laying a brown egg instead of an olive egg, where the F2s have essentially a 100% chance of laying the olive egg. Yeah. I mean, because basically the only reason people are buying this bird is to get the green egg. Yeah. So if you can 100% give them a chance that they're going to get a green egg, that's what you're going to do. Absolutely. If somebody's coming to you and wanting this chicken and all of a sudden one in every 16 birds is giving brown yep. eggs, yep. you're not going to have a good reputation for these right. chickens. So some of this brought up some questions in my brain. You know, we are very much heritage breed girls. Oh, yeah. We will love a colored egg, but we love our heritage breeds. Yeah. And since I've been learning more about genetics as we ease into breeding nankins, my question was, is it possible to cross these crosses too much? What happens if you keep breeding them generation after generation? Right. I don't know. It's hard to say. It is hard to say. And I think another thing is when you do this, then their genetics become weaker. And this is when you have more reproductive problems showing or something just off with the chicken health wise. To me, that's the problem when you breed too much for one thing. It's definitely a risk. I mean, you take that risk. Right now, if you're sticking with, say, F1 and F2 generations, they're crosses of heritage breeds. Yeah. And they're probably benefiting from all that hybrid vigor. Yeah. So you get this friendly, big, healthy chicken that lays a gorgeous egg. I do not know what would happen if you're breeding, say, F3s and F4s. And then and do you need to? If you take this F1, which is these two chickens, uh-huh. and then you breed it to the other two chickens, uh-huh. and then you have a cross of four chickens. Right. What I, are I, you that, doing to all those lines? Exactly. I don't have a good answer to these questions. I don't know that anyone does at this no. point. But there are interesting questions. In the grand scheme of things, we don't want to make a chicken just for our sheer want of green eggs. Agreed. And then overbreed it to the point where it's not healthy. Right. It doesn't have all the distinct, strong genetic factors that its original breed had. Right. Right. Because like we said in the reproductive episode with Dr. Rebecca, we're talking about hybrids and they're already heightened to have these problems for reproduction. Exactly. Now that's definitely more the case with the production layers, but this is just something to think about if you're out there breeding and trying to come up with your own crosses for egg color. Exactly. It might not be a great idea. I mean, honestly, if I wanted olive eggers, I would probably just go to the local farm supplies that have such healthy eggs. Locally here, I think the mill has them, and I know Bauman's, uh, which we really like. That's well, where we got our speckled Gertie sausage. Gertie came from the mill. Right. And she was in the 50 olive acres that came to the store with a one chicken that looked different in the 50 olive right. acres. I went to the feed store to get an olive acre. When you start trying to breed your own chickens to get this green color egg, like you said, you don't know what's going to happen to your chicken. Yeah, I know some people really enjoy the breeding, and that's great. Again, what we're questioning is whether successive generations will be as healthy. I probably wouldn't want to do the breeding myself. I would probably just go buy them exactly. from you know a local place where they get healthy chicks. So, all in all, we think that these F1s and F2s are absolutely yes. great birds. They're great birds and easy to find. Exactly. Any of the large hatcheries carry them, feed stores, like we said. You could even buy hatching eggs. A lot of people sell hatching eggs online, and you could bring your own if you are interested in keeping the parent breeds, the heritage breeds. Send us your pictures of your olive acres. We would love to see all the And your olive eggs. Yeah, and tell us what chickens, if you know which chickens are in there. We would love to see them and compare them. So there's your olive acre. Fascinating chickens, gorgeous eggs. We don't have much of an origin story for them, but they are fascinating. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. Okay, so now it's time for main topic, yeah. Main yeah. topic, yeah. 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 
We've had a lot of questions lately about snacks. Yes, we're having a lot of listeners ask us some really important questions on snacks. So this main topic is the skinny on snacks. Yeah. And it is something that we well, kind of all want to talk about. Right, and I don't know that the feeding is intuitive. We're giving you 27 years of combined chicken experience to say this is how we've learned to feed our flock snacks. And the primary thing there is you let your chickens eat their regular food all day, all day, and snacks in the afternoons, early evening. There's multiple rules about snacking, but the number one main rule is exactly what Holly Ann just said. Snacks are only in the afternoon. There's a reason, and we've talked about this with multiple guests on our show, that big food companies have hired scientists and spent billions of dollars on research for these foods to come up with a commercial food that gives your chickens exactly what they need. Right. And they need to eat that food as the majority of their diet. There are so many excellent food companies out there to choose from. You can go with any of the big commercial companies that produce layer crumble or off locks. There's probably farms. If you want insect protein, you can go with the excellent layer pellets or layer crumble from Grubbly Farms. You can go with one of the organic companies where it's more of a seed and grain-based food. Right. Any of these companies have spent a lot of money formulating a complete diet for your flock, meaning that's all your flock needs. Right. But... We like to enhance their diet a bit. We do. And it's kind of the same rule with people. So just think of yourself in this. You're going to be eating your three meals a day and they're your main meals. And that's where you're getting your most nutrients and your protein and everything that you need. And the snacks are put in sparingly and with small amounts. Right. And there are some things that you can give your flock more of safely. Right. Say greens. I don't think there's ever a time where you can't give your flock greens. So we're talking about kale. If you're doing green, spinach is the one you want to use extremely sparingly. I actually don't even feed it to my flock. I don't use it either. Everybody has been watching our videos on Instagram where we're feeding the kale and the corn. We go with kale for greens. It's safer. Kale is great. You know, I like to grow the microgreens, so like some radish greens. Right. We'll talk more about greens as we get into the seasons. Yeah. But you can't go wrong with kale. Really, most of the greens, with the exception of spinach that you could buy in the grocery store to give your chickens, should be fine. Right. So those are the main things. And the other thing is letting the seasons guide your snacks. So let's start with winter. We're in winter right now. We're talking about warmth. And one of the big things people want to do is give their flock a hot meal in the morning. You can give them oatmeal. Right. We do prefer to keep those carbohydrates for later in the day. Yeah. We really have completely gone to giving our birds a hot mash in the morning made from their own feed. Yes. So if you want to give something warm, that is definitely the way to go is to take your food and put water in your microwave in a measuring cup for a minute and then pouring it in. I'm on very nice well water, so we just do hot water right out of the tap. Yeah. It works perfectly. Yeah, and then just pouring it over the food, and they're eating their food, and they're getting a warm meal. Most of them love it. They, they love do. the mash. It's a different consistency, uh-huh. so they think it's different, Right, it's not. right. And also, if you add hot water to the food, it does make it more fragrant for Probably them. they can smell it more, yeah. They can smell it yeah. more. It gets some more liquid into them, too, which is never a bad thing. Exactly. Now, winter equals one thing for snacks is more carbohydrates. Most definitely. Let's look at carbohydrates. Carbohydrates rev up your body and rev up your metabolism. Uh And what we need is that body to start revving up when they're going to go to bed. Right. Especially the whole grains where it takes a little more energy to digest them, which keeps their body temperature up a bit. Right. So that's when you can add warm oats. Right. That you would make as prepared on the Yeah, you could just make them, obviously, no sugar. You're you're making straight oats. You're not using anything flavored. Right. The only thing we do add are red pepper flakes and a little bit of cinnamon. And that's when you can give that warm meal. That's going to be hearty. Their body's going to process it overnight. And that's what kind of kicks in their little furnace when we think about them as a little furnace. Yeah. I start giving more scratch grains in the winter. I started in the fall, but then in the winter, I give a really good quality, like a five grain scratch. It's got some cracked corn, red winter wheat pellets. And what you're saying right there, corn. 
Corn is major. Yep. Corn is another thing. It kind of has a lot of sugars. It and does. It's a vegetable, but it acts as a carbohydrate. Right. So it takes more for the body to break that down. And that's why in the evenings, we take frozen corn, cook it in yeah. the microwave, and add that to the greens and the oats. I actually will mix that up with some scratch, too, and throw it out. They love right. it. Right. And because it does raise the body temperature, corn definitely raises that little furnace. The reason why we're not overloading the protein, and we're going to talk about the protein a little more as we go along. In the winter, really, their protein needs are met by their feet, and it's the carbohydrate that they need. And a couple of notes about oatmeal. Oatmeal sometimes gets a bad rap. Sometimes you'll hear or read someone saying that the beta-glucans in oats are harmful for birds. We did a whole article about this. It's on our website, The Real Deal on Oatmeal. I will relink that in our show notes yes, so people can definitely. see it. But we went and broke down all the scientific studies yeah. about the way oats affect chickens. And the overwhelming evidence is that oats are far more positive oh, yeah. than detrimental. In fact, there's really no hard and fast evidence that they're detrimental at all, but they are definitely beneficial. They're a really great carbohydrate that starts the metabolism. The thing about oats, which are great, if you're running late and you can't take a lot of time, you can give oats dry. You can give right. oats warmed up as in a cereal. Yeah. And both do the same thing. It makes us feel better to give them a little warm meal before bed, too, and it gets that body working. That's a productive snack that's going to help them. Right. Other than that, in the winter, I don't think they should get a whole lot of other snacks. They can get grubs. Those are going to give them calcium and protein that they're going to need. Grubs are absolutely amazing snacks, especially yes. the ones that are created here in the United States. Yes, just like Grubbly, Grubbly Farms. Farms. Right. Our sponsor, Grubbly Farms, probably makes, honestly, I've tried a lot of them over the years. And they make And the I've best. always gone back to Grubbly's. They do. They're excellent. They do give a calcium and a protein boost. Your flock doesn't need tons of them. You can give them daily yeah. in small amounts. Exactly. And you can do that through the seasons. The other thing I like in winter, depending on what the grass looks like, if there's any grass, we're back to the green. Right. If I can grow them myself, that's great. If not, I'll grab a bag of kale or something at the, exactly. at the supermarket for them. Because the chickens are looking for green stuff that's not out there. Right. And there's a lot of phytonutrients in the plants that chickens really benefit from. Okay. So let's go into after winter, we're going into spring. Please. <laughs> So we can still continue with the fresh greens. Uh huh. We're going to taper back a little bit on the scratch and the oats right. a little smaller because we don't want that body rubbing up. And also, we're going to cut back on the corn a little bit. A little, yeah, it's those, starting to warm up. It's starting to warm up. We don't need that little furnace burning as much. So we're going to switch over. Right. I think with spring and summer, it's kind of on the same lines. Depending upon what the weather is, Right. we want hydration. Yes. That's what we're yes. looking for. One of the good things about spring is you're starting to see greens again. Oh, yeah. So if you can let your chickens out, they can find dandelion greens, which are fantastic. Yes. And if for some reason you can't free range that day, I'll go pick them handfuls of dandelion greens. Me too. Oh, do you know what garlic cress is? Yes. It's an invasive, right? Yeah. My chickens lose their minds for it. I think you've said that to me yes. before. And so because it's an invasive, you can just go harvest it by the handful. Yeah. Throw it right in there. Let your chickens eat exactly. it. Exactly. It's actually delicious. We'll have to do my recipe for foraged garlic crust pesto later in the season. You've served me that at your house. It's not a, that one, but garlic crust and something else. Yeah, it's I delicious. I think we did it with eggs. Probably. So you've got greens to forage for. You taper back on the scratch and the oats. And as we get into the warmer parts of summer, you're right, hydration becomes important. Yeah, and at this point in spring and summer, you can bring in the berries, the strawberry tops, right. blueberries, different things that are good for them, have vitamins, but are right. going to keep hydration up. Yes, Spring, just like fall, is a mixed bag. Actually, spring is the most mixed bag that you can kind of In a get. lot of ways, yeah. Summer, 100%. Watermelon, hydration, right. keeping them cooler. So Berries. You, know, you don't want to give them anything, no oatmeal, that's going to help bring that body temperature up. Right. The yeah, you're trying to keep them cool. You're trying to keep the moisture going. So just another mention of spring. Foods are starting to come up in spring. You're not into summer yet, but right. one of my favorite things to grow is rhubarb. Yeah. Love the rhubarb. Do not feed your chickens rhubarb leaves. Rhubarb yeah. leaves are poisonous to everything. That's very good to know. I mean, you could feed them some of the stalk. I've never fed rhubarb the to my chickens. The other thing when you talk about stalk, we've had this question before, broccoli. 
Broccoli should most definitely be cooked, steamed, boiled before. The stalk is very hard and fibrous. Yeah. And they have trouble eating it. Now, the crowns, they can eat without a problem. Right. But if you're going to do that, I would boil the stalks if that's what you want to put out there. Or just get a bag and steam it. Broccoli is fine year round, but it's much better for them cooked. Yeah, there's always the danger that they're going to try to eat that fibrous stuff. and It's hard to pass. I've had chickens go into the garden and just take bites off the broccoli. Yeah. And that's fine because it's the whole thing and they're just taking right. bites off. They're not trying to get a whole hunk of right. stem down there. I love in the summer when the mulberries are ripe because I will shake a tree yeah. and they will come running for those yeah. mulberries. I mean, I love blueberries. The other thing that you can do in summer is freeze your treats because then yeah. it helps to bring that body temperature down a little bit. Right. Blueberries frozen. Grapes cut in half, frozen. It's easier any of the for them melons, to eat. Watermelon, any of the above. Anything. They love that. They love those. And that's always good for bringing the body temperature down. The snacks are a good way to regulate body temperature. Yeah, they really in, can be. In all the different seasons yep. and all the different ways. So it's just about being smart. The other thing is don't be taken by your chickens. You don't have to have a snack in hand every, every time. time. No, no. That's what they want. Right. They're training you to say, oh, you don't have a snack. Feel bad for us. No. But that food is out 24-7 if they are hungry at all. Their commercial feed is out at all times. Right. And again, things like grublies or high protein sources are fine in moderation. Yes. You can give them daily, but you don't need to give tons of them. We'll talk in just a bit here about the dangers of too much protein. In the summer, obviously, there's grass. Yeah. All kinds of greens can and be bugs. growing in the garden, right? They'll forage on their own if you they do will. supervise free ranging. They'll go and find their own little bugs to eat and have a great time with it. Produce from your garden, we should probably talk a bit about. Cucumbers and zucchini especially. Yes. We feed them whole. Yeah. You are not going to shave off anything because those shavings. The peelings. I don't feed peelings. Blockages. Yeah, I don't feed peelings from anything anymore. No. Even apple peelings, I don't. I just compost them. Yeah. Anything that can stick in their crop, uh, we're gun shy about that. So whole cucumbers. Whole zucchini, whole squash. Yeah. You might have to cut it in half to get them started. Yeah. But again, like you said, you don't want any peelings. Lots and lots of other greens that are blooming. In the summer, I like to grow boatloads of nasturtium. Yeah. I just love them. And the nasturtiums are usually only good until the first frost. So I will grab whole hunks of leaves and throw they, they love nasturtium leaves. Oh, yeah. Also makes a good pesto. Okay. So let's move on to fall. Uh -huh. Fall is kind of a complicated season because fall is a time that we may want to bring a little bit more protein in just during molting. Molt, right. So there are good ways to do protein. Frozen peas. Yes. You can give a few more of your grubs, those types of things. But it all is weather depending. Especially during molting, I really like shellless sunflower yes. seeds because yes. that extra fat, yes. the protein, I like to give them a little bit of that, throw some grublies in there. You can go back to a little bit of scratch yep. on cooler evenings. Yeah. We're definitely going back and forth weather related with these snacks. We really do try to do snacks in a very seasonal way with our flock. Yeah. It does because they can benefit from the snacks themselves. They're not just going to be empty, dense calories that we're throwing exactly. out there. If we can make them work for their body in a good way, yeah. that's what we're going to do. The other thing is what Dr. Rebecca talked about on our hen's reproductive health. There are risks to too much protein in our snacks. Too much protein, too much calcium. Too much protein can cause kidney damage. Yes. And there's no way to reverse it once it has gone too nope. far. That is heartbreaking. Yeah. You don't want to you go don't down that go road. There. No. Too much calcium is definitely a problem in anything other than a laying hen. Right. It can cause gout, crystal deposits in major organs. Again, not reversible. One of the other problems with overfeeding snacks is that then you mess up your chicken's recommended daily allowances. They're natural flora, for one thing. I suppose that's true, too. You Their can... gut health. Sometimes too many snacks can be too rich for them and cause diarrhea. We've had a lot yeah. of listeners say, my chickens have diarrhea. Actually, too much protein can cause diarrhea. Yeah. Too much protein puts stress on the kidneys, and it leads to excessive water consumption, right. which can lead to diarrhea. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, definitely a problem. I think the number one rule is the same rule that you would use for yourself. Small, 
in moderation and let's choose smart snacks that are going to work yes. for us healthy snacks during the season right if you keep it that way you shouldn't have a problem and like we said one of the reasons we favor the insect snacks produced here in the US or in North America is because sometimes if they're coming from Asia, they've been fumigated. Exactly. And they do contain chemicals that you don't want your flock consuming. Yeah, that's the number one thing. We know in the UK, they really can't feed these kinds of treats. Right. Because a lot of the insects have been fed on catering waste. If you're in the UK, you're going with your oats. Your We call scratch in the UK is mixed corn. Right. Those things. And then produce, grass, greens, flowers, all of those things are great for your flock. Another great thing to throw out with your scratch is just plain cracked corn. Yeah, you can. In the afternoon, a handful, the corn really revs up the body to keep them warm. A lot of times in the afternoon, everyone's hunched. They're ready to go to bed. Yeah. You throw out some things for them to go forage and scratch around the bed. It gets them moving a little bit more, it especially the older girls. And full. Right. You know, so, so they're going to bed with a full crop. Exactly. Okay. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to message us or email us and we will answer them the best that we can. Now we want to move on. We have a special guest who we interviewed a while back, who is going to be our retail therapy and our cracking the eggs this week. Our guest is Lisa Steele. She runs the blog Fresh Eggs Daily. She has written several books. This will be her first cookbook she's joining us to talk about. Lisa has generously shared two recipes for us. So we're going to talk about this with her in the interview, but we will have them linked in the show notes. So now we're going to bring you this interview. Enjoy. So Grace's book goes on sale tomorrow. February 15th. It will be out in the wild on bookstore shelves everywhere. So you're straight off of Valentine's Day. It's a good day to put a book out there for everybody to love on and to snuggle up and read, get their honey to make them something that's in there. I guess. It's a gorgeous cookbook, chock full of recipes using everyone's favorite ingredient. Lots of fresh eggs. Yes. Gorgeous photography. And I've got to say, before we even start, there are two recipes in there I have not had a chance to make yet, but I'm dying to make. Your maple walnut cake and the cheesy mushroom pie. They look amazing. You know, it's funny. I love hearing what really stands out to people because I have my ideas of what are my favorites, but I love hearing what really speaks to people. Those are two of my favorites. I was really upset the cheesy mushroom pie didn't get a photo. You know, they can't do a photo for every uh, recipe, unfortunately, but it's gorgeous. And it's just, I love it. It's so hearty and yummy and delicious. So good choices, both super comfort foods. I think you're going to love them. I've been eyeing up the sour recipes. My husband likes the sour. So do I. The mixed drinks. Yes, Mm -hmm. the mixed drinks. They're awesome. Yeah, they really look amazing. So what we wanted to ask you is you've been taking care of chickens for a lot of years. What inspired you to move from chickens to the cookbook? You know, it's actually kind of funny because when COVID hit, it became like the COVID pivot you know, and all these businesses had to figure out how to stay afloat and what to do and changing and this and that. And that was right around the time when I decided I really wanted to write a cookbook. And, you know, I pitched it to my editor over and over again. And he was like, no, just keep writing chicken books. And, you know, I pitched it and he's like, okay, it's COVID. You got to write another chicken book. Like everyone wants to get chickens. And I've written six books and and 700 blog articles. Like I don't have any more to say about chickens. I really don't, <laughs> you know? And I finally convinced him of that and we parted ways. He was super sweet though. He said, if you do want to come back and write another chicken book, we're here. But I said to him, I really need to pursue this and write the cookbook. Like it's inside of me, it's bursting to come out. And I don't care that it's COVID and everyone wants chickens and you want a new book from me. People can read my other books. They can read my blog. I just need to work on a cookbook. But it's actually worked out because all these people that got chickens in the last two years now hopefully have tons of eggs and they don't know what to do with them. So, you know, it was the next step for me that was super logical to me. Are you making these all the time, just going through all your eggs with these recipes? Obviously, I'm not a chef. I'm not a recipe developer. I'm not, I really have no formal, you know, cooking background. But fortunately, yes, I mean, we've had chickens for the last 12 years. I have cooked eggs every which way, up and down. I have my favorites. I also wanted to include some things that, you know, maybe I cooked with my mom or my grandmother. That was super important to me. They both had chickens also. But I also wanted this book to be somewhat of like a basic book. Like I know me personally picking up an egg cookbook. I want to see a pudding, a creme brulee, Boston cream pie, lemon meringue pie, angel food cake, pound cake. 
of all the egg cookbooks I looked through, there wasn't really one that had all of these kind of standard egg centric recipes that you could use over and over again, you know, the classics. And I think this last generation or couple of generations, we've lost a lot of the baking and cooking skills. So you don't necessarily know how to make a pound cake. It surprised me how many people didn't know where the name pound cake came from, you know, that it, it oh. used a pound of flour, a pound of sugar, a mm. pound of eggs and a pound of butter. And the fact that people don't know things like that, like I thought it was important to go back to those basics. So those kind of mm. classic recipes are, are just kind of basic. But yes, it's a lot that, that I do cook a lot in our own home or, you know, ones that I were family recipes, which was nice. Yeah, that's lovely. So now that this amazing labor of love is finished, what are you doing? It's funny because it's it's not really finished. It's sort of like the hard work starts when the book comes out mm -hmm. or leading up to it. I mean, I've been crazy busy. I had a little bit of a break after we turned in all the recipes, did all the photos while the book was being formatted and printed. I had a break, but the last month or so has just been crazy with, with media, with podcasts and radio interviews and magazine interviews. And once the book comes out, I just have so much stuff booked to try to promote it. You know, it's authors who write a book and think that their job is done when they finish writing the book are sadly mistaken because... But that's the fun part, right? Is going out and promoting what you love about the book and sharing it with all of us. That's the goal to get to, you well, know? Well, you would love that because you're the marketing ace. I'm the writer. <laughs> I'm the writer. She's the marketer. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And it's completely different than the writing part. You know, that's what I really mm -hmm. love about writing books. And this was very different than writing my chicken books, but there are a lot of similarities, but there's so many pieces, you know, that there's the idea and then you're laying out the organization and you're actually writing it. Then you're thinking about photos, then you're approving the cover and the formatting, and then you're promoting. So there, there are so many pieces. And for someone who gets bored super easily, like I do, there's not time to be bored because you're just mm. moving on to something else. So I'm I'm yeah. super, like I said, I, I love hearing which recipes stand out to people. You know, you flip through the book and you're like, this is what I'm going to make, you know, or a magazine says we want to do a feature and this is the recipe, you know, and it's just interesting, like the thought process behind that. So yeah. which is your favorite part of the whole process? I love it all, but I have to say this time, I have had photographers before, professional photographers come, but it's been chicken photos, you know, outdoors yeah. at our farm. And the photo shoot for the recipes was amazing. It was two weeks in Connecticut. It was a professional photographer and her assistant who ironed the napkins and got the prop plates and whatever. Then there were two people preparing the recipes and a food stylist who I just like followed around her like a puppy dog, you know, she was doing like the perfect, you know, whipped cream dollop and the spritz of olive oil. And the it was fascinating. It was funny because they said to me, it was, that was April of last year, I guess. So it was like full on COVID. And they said to me, you don't have to be there. We have the recipes. They're going to do all the shopping. They're going to make them like, you honestly don't need to be there. And I was like, are you kidding? First of all, it's an excuse to leave the house, which I haven't done in months. And secondly, I felt like I could learn so much about food photography, you know, just watching them make my recipes, which was surreal in the first place, just sit back and watch. And then they would make it. And then the food stylist would come in and just make it beautiful, you know, and I had supplied photos of all of them because as I was going along, I took photos as I was recipe mm -hmm. testing and we had them on the refrigerator. So they knew what we were doing for the day. And then to look at my photo, which I mean, I'm not a terrible photographer. I think I'm like passable, right? But to look at my photo compared to the photo for the book, like my mind was blown that these were my yeah. recipes. And then we had like all these boards along the wall and they were sticking them, which chapter they went in. I mean, I could do that. I just wanted to do that the rest of my life. It was like six women for two weeks, just like blasting tunes, drinking coffee, making food, photographing it. I was like, I just love this. I just want to do this forever. <laughs> like a completely amazing time. It I really we, does. I think we spoke with Lisa. She was coming home from there. Last I think, year. yeah, I think you're right. You had talked about it with us and you just went through that experience. Mm -hmm. And I think on the show, we did talk about it. Seeing those recipes that you put your heart in come to life. That's got really to be an experience good like yeah, no other, for really. Sure. It so, was crazy. It was really nerve wracking though, too, because I mean, just imagine handing someone a recipe and then making it and then tasting it like right in front of you. And I mean, th these are people who have worked with Martha Stewart and Rachel Ray and Giada, you know, and Ina Garten, like they weren't slouches, you know, right. <laughs> so they're like, the pros, ah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So this is a weird question because we know that like breeds of chickens don't have different tastes to their eggs. 
But do you have a chicken whose egg you like the best? No. You know, it's it's just the overall diet of like what your flock yeah. eats and that the eggs are fresh. And I mean, people mm-hmm. claim, oh, we like the blue eggs or, you know, this person will only, whatever. They all taste the same. Are you kidding me? I think it was the Duchess of Devonshire who is quoted as saying that the eggs from her coach and pullets always tasted the best. No, I didn't think my coach and pullet eggs, while they were delicious, tasted any different than anything else. So fresh eggs, which of the recipes in the book does the best for the freshest just laid eggs? I think it's really super important to have a fresh egg when you're poaching because the whites are going to be still super thick and you, you, you want the egg to, you know, kind of stay together when you're poaching mm-hmm. it. An older egg, the whites are just going to, same with right. frying eggs. You put an older egg into the pan, the whites mm-hmm. just spread all over the they pan, do. you know, and a fresh egg is going to stay. So I think fr- frying or poaching, I think if you're baking with them or, or doing something else, it's not quite as important. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously the right answer is you should use fresh eggs for everything. But yeah, I think when you're frying or poaching, that's when you're going to notice the biggest difference because the eggs are not going to stick together as well. Are you, are you a firm believer in a refrigerated egg versus a room temperature egg? We've kind of learned along the way that room temperature eggs tend to bake much better than a refrigerated egg. Yeah, that's definitely true. All of your cream, you know, unless it specifically calls for chilled, you know, for your like flaky crusts and things, you want to use chilled butter and chilled whatever. But yeah, when you're baking, your you want your milk, your eggs, your butter, you want it all to be room temperature because if something cold hits, especially your fats in your mm-hmm. cream or your butter, it's going to just like seize them up really fast. So yeah, room temperature. And that's one benefit to having chickens. You know, if you don't wash your eggs, you don't have to refrigerate them. So you can always have a bowl on the counter to bake from. You can put an egg in a glass of warm water for a while if you forget to take one out, but it's just easier just to have a bowl on the counter exactly. to just grab from. But yeah, that it definitely makes a difference. It's so funny when people come into my home and they see my ceramic egg carton is full of my eggs right on my kitchen counter and they're not chicken people and they're like, oh, yeah, why are the eggs on the counter? And I'm trying to explain to them, you don't have to refrigerate. That is a little bit of a myth. They will last longer refrigerated, right, but, but on the counter, they're just fine. And sometimes they're better to cook with them. And way. honestly, they look beautiful. Oh, I agree. Yeah. there's And what people don't realize is a lot of restaurants, they'll get their eggs in those big, you know, flats mm-hmm. and they just stack them in the kitchen. Like they don't yeah. refrigerate because they're using them so fast. My grandfather used to actually supply eggs to a lot of restaurants in those flats and they just stack them up in the back of the restaurant, not refrigerated. It it's, makes sense. Yeah. It's so funny because I feel like I have a lot in common with Lisa mm-hmm. because my family were Italian immigrants and they ran an egg farm here in Maryland in the late 40s and early 50s. So I'm actually a generational chicken farmer myself. That's awesome. It was my great grandparents who came from Italy and my mom grew up on a chicken farm. So she actually has a little bit of the opposite effect from growing up on a large scale chicken farm. She gets afraid of the chicken. Yeah, she can be afraid. I inherited the blood in my genes to love the chicken. (laughs) But it's so funny because it is in your DNA at some point. It's so funny to look back at pictures of my great grandparents and how they sold eggs throughout the whole state. And it's a nice heritage. It really Mm -hmm. is. You have kind of the same story. You're kind of a little bit like my mom at first. I've heard you before say the chickens, they didn't grow on you as a child. (laughs) No, and my mom, she grew up, you know, on my grandparents' chicken farm. And she's not a big fan of chickens. Yeah. Yeah, I think that happens. That's my mom also. Yeah. And even my chickens that get cuddled and held, she comes up and still stays away from them. She is kind of afraid of them. It my is. family has a very long history of keeping chickens and farming horses. So I'm kind of jealous of the two of you. <laughs> so speaking That's funny. of chickens, Lisa, are you getting any chicks this spring? I am not. I have so much going on and I don't know when I'll be home, when I'll be traveling. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was better just not to commit to anything this spring. Understandable. It is. I mean, with promoting the book and being out on the road, it will be hard. You put all this hard work and your heart into this book. We didn't ask this question before, but what is your favorite recipe in the book? I think in general, My favorite way to eat eggs would either be Eggs Benedict or Creme Brulee, just because they're just basic, classic. They really highlight your eggs. So it was funny because I actually didn't choose the cover photo, but it ended up being the Eggs Benedict. 
which is kind of interesting because I never, you know, mentioned to the design team that that was one of my favorite recipes, but I'm super happy with it. That would be my choice. One sweet, one savory. And that's the recipe you shared last time was the eggs Benedict. And it, you know, sometimes your love just shines through that recipe and it can be found. And are you happy with the cover and the, the final picture that's on it? I am. I'm really happy. And I, what I'm happiest about is that I was so involved in the process for my other books. I sort of lost control somewhere along the way and they were smaller publishers. So I had every intention that I would lose control of the cover, the title, the format, everything. And they really kept me involved and asked for my input. And, you know, I feel like if I had chosen something they absolutely hated, I probably would have been overruled, but it definitely was a collaborative effort from all of us. And of course, I'm going to listen to their input as well, because they're the professionals. I mean, these people sell books for a living, you know, so if they tell me that they think this cover is going to sell better, I'm not going to override them with something that I just feel I want. But we all were sort of unanimous when we had like the final eight covers, you know, one was just ingredients, you know, they they were all very, very different. And just the font and the colors and everything we all sort of agreed on. Oh, the colors are lovely. It yeah, really does really look, pretty. it looks fantastic. So what will your next project look like? Well, for the near future, I will be promoting this book that will probably take me through till summer, at least, you know, through chick season, Easter, that whole thing. And then I don't know, I have some ideas, but I don't really know yet. And I've been so busy wrapped up in this cookbook. It's Mm -hmm. pretty much taken over my life for the last two years. So it'll be nice just to, you know, have it truly finished and then be able to relax a little bit and figure out what's next. Yeah. Some snuggles and hugs with the chickens will be well-deserved. We love Sherman. He's such a cutie. We're rooster gals. I don't have any, but I live through Holly Ann. She has eight. I have eight. eight. My husband and I are doing very minor conservation breeding of the endangered nankin bantams. And as you okay. know, if you hatch eggs, you end up with more cockerels and hens. So because we don't eat our chickens and because these things are the most adorable little roosters you've ever seen, we built them their own special bachelor flock over in our sheep field. So that's how I ended up with oh, that's cute. roosters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that'll They're work. Adorable. Yeah. The bantams are, I mean, Sherman's a bantam too. And, and that's yeah. why he stuck around so long because he's too small to really cause much trouble. He's super cute. He that's really a, is. We try to let everybody <laughs> know that sometimes a rooster isn't a bad thing. They can fit into your flock. He fit into yours. Sometimes it takes a few tries, though. And I mean, it's, it's such a personal decision. Yes. You know, if you if you decide to have a rooster, that's great. If you decide not to have a rooster, that's fine, too. Exactly. Sometimes a rooster doesn't work for you. And that's why we always tell people, have a rooster plan. Yeah. You know where your roosters are going to go if they don't work for your plan. And we know right. that not everyone is crazy enough to build a whole, <laughs> you know, boy <laughs> emporium on the side of their little farm. So <laughs> You have some lucky boys. Yes, we do. We love those boys. So thank you, Lisa, so much for coming on and talking with us about your new fantastic cookbook. Holly Ann, you're going to be having links to everything. Absolutely. So the cookbook drops tomorrow. That is a street date. We will have links on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. You can also purchase the book on Lisa's website, which we will have linked in the show notes. Lisa, thank you again. It is always delightful speaking with you. So much fun. We love catching up with you. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, we just want to thank Lisa one more time for a great interview. Yeah, thank you so much for talking to us, Lisa. We love it. And again, the links to her book are in our show notes. Check it out. Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, it's a different breed spotlight. We're going to be talking about the Peking, also known as the Cochin Bantam. Huh? Yes, we are. Investigating those adorable little chickens. Our guest is Libby Siddle from Henley's Coops. She is our resident expert on red mite. Oh, that was a fascinating conversation. Yeah, we're going to talk all about <laughs> red mite and how to get it out of your coop. Our crack in the eggs is Libby's Mum's Fluffy Omelets, which Yay! are ridiculously good. And our retail therapy is Vintage Egg Cups. We can't wait. What should we tell everybody to do until we talk to them next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. (laughs) Don't forget, we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.